So good morning. Welcome, by the way. As Dr. Bergeron said, I'm Josiah Bornagian. I got my Bachelor of Music in Jazz Studies at California State University, Northridge in Los Angeles. I got my Master of Arts degree in Jazz Performance at <coughs> City College of New York, which is part of the City University of New York system. It's a wonderful public university out there. So, and I also taught on faculty for a while at City College of New York. So a lot of the information I'm going to be sharing with you today actually comes from the interactions I've had with some very prominent New York jazz musicians during my time at City College. Um, so now, as Dr. Bergeron said, I'm here at Frost. I'm getting a DMA, Doctor of Musical Arts degree in instrumental jazz performance and studio music. I'm also getting a cognate in musicology, which is sort of the doctoral equivalent of a minor. You know, you have your major and then your minor. So I'm also uh, in the musicology world. So. Today I'm going to talk about a really fascinating period of jazz history, and I'm going to focus on one really seminal jazz ensemble. And since this is primarily a listening course, I know Dr. Bergeron really likes to emphasize listening, and that's really important to me, I'm actually going to start by just playing a recording. So just sit back, relax, I want you guys to just listen, I'm not going to tell you anything about it, and then I'll ask you a few questions, so here we go. Pretty hip, right? Yeah. yeah. So, somebody uh, go ahead and raise their hand. Let's take a stab at this. Who's your best guess? Who do you, who do you think this is? If you had one, one quick guess. Someone take a stab. Who is this? I think yeah. I know the song. What's the song? Is it um, per, uh, preparing for a mental breakdown? Close. Yeah, it's a tune called Rehearsing, Rehearsing. for a Nervous Breakdown. <laughs> You're going to want to write that down. This is going to be an interesting log. Rehearsing. Rehearsing. With an apostrophe for a nervous breakdown. Does anybody want to take a stab at who the artist is? Best guess. Anybody, anything. Got nothing to lose. Casey Benjamin. Casey Benjamin. No. <laughs> no. Okay, so this is a group that's led by John Kirby. You want to write that down? John Kirby, J O H N. Kirby is K-I-R-B-Y. Uh, we'll talk more about who he is and who's in the band in a little bit, but um, a couple other quick questions. What was the instrumentation? Someone raise their hand and tell me. What do you think the instrumentation was there? What instruments were in the band? Yeah. Clarinet. Clarinet? Good. What else? Trumpet and trombone. <coughs> Trumpet. Not a trombone, but I, I'll, I see why you would say that, and I'll explain it in a minute. Yeah. yeah. Piano. What else? Bass. Bass. Drums. Drums. 
What else? Saxophone. There was an alto saxophone. Good. And banjo. Not a banjo, but a. Oh, someone else. Yeah. yeah. So. Okay. Six instruments. This is a sextet. Piano, bass, drums, clarinet, trumpet, alto. Okay. Uh, what style of jazz would you call this? What historical <laughs> style period would you place this in if I forced you to try and pigeonhole it? Dixieland. Okay. Got to vote for Dixieland. Yeah. Hot jazz. Hot jazz, okay. Free bop. Free bop, okay. Very, very different ideas of what this could be. Um, so let me pick on a couple of you guys and say why. So you said Dixieland. What about the music makes you think Dixieland? What elements of the music? Um, I guess the instrumentation kind of and the harmonic progression. I guess a lot of the rhythmic ideas were kind of not really Dixieland, but a little more complex. Excellent observation. So. I promise this is all leading somewhere. Dixieland, you could make an argument that this has a Dixieland influence, right? And he brought up a good point, the instrumentation, number one. For me, it's the format of the music. Did you guys hear the breaks? Yeah. Instrumental breaks, right? The whole band stops, one musician performs a short solo passage, right? That's highly characteristic of New Orleans jazz, traditional jazz, Dixieland jazz. So that's a strong argument for the, the two people who said trad jazz or, or those types of music. Uh, you said pre bop right? right? What about the music makes you think this is leading right into pre bop Kind of going on what you said about the rhythms and the ideas being a little bit more complex than uh, I guess what was normally done in the Dixieland or traditional jazz. It seems like the kind of ideas they're going for is very, very much like, sounds like what that kind of music is, is eventually going to evolve into. And um, the instrumentation too. And like, the, call, the sort of call and response thing that they had going on in the um, when they were playing through the head, it's, it reminded me kind of like uh, a phenomenon that happens in Bebop. Okay, good. Yeah, and that, well, that could also be a phenomenon that would happen in Dixieland as well, or or Bebop, and even in swing contexts. You said you thought you heard a trombone. That's totally okay, and I'll explain why I think that's okay in a minute. So, if you were imagining a trombone. What type of, of band are you thinking of now if you've got a saxophone, a clarinet, a trumpet, a trombone, and a full rhythm section? Yeah, we're leading towards a big band sound, right? Raise your hand. Did that sound highly arranged to you? Yes, it was. It was a very intricate, very clearly written out or at least memorized arrangement, which we tend to associate with, with which style of jazz? The swing or the big band, right? So, um, before I move on, are there any other observations on what you guys heard? Anything that you're just burning to to know or share. Yeah? Um, I'm just wondering, you said that John Kirby was the leader of the band. What was the name of the group? We'll get there in a minute. Okay. Hold that thought. Okay, cool. So, one of my big main points of bringing up this band is a larger point about how we study and talk about history. Uh, you guys are in a jazz history class, and it's really important that you learn the historical style periods and you learn the characteristics that define and describe those style periods. But sometimes, as historians in jazz history classes and in textbooks, sometimes we kind of paint the picture that it's really hard and fast. This is bebop, and it does X, Y, and Z, and that's that. And it's either bebop or it's not. What I love about this group is that they remind me a lot of Duke Ellington, Miles Davis, John Coltrane, and a lot of other jazz musicians, in that they're impossible to pin down in terms of their style. You know, they, this could be Dixieland, arguably. A more, maybe a little bit more modern take on Dixieland. It could be a pared down big band. Or it could be uh, just before bebop, kind of somebody stretching the swing style and leaning towards bebop. And the answer is it, it really is all of those things. This group is a key transitional group. And so I want you to think about history in terms of more nuance and complexity in gray areas. And this group is a classic example of that. Okay, so this group is called John Kirby and his Onyx Club Boys, O-N-Y-X. Uh, John Kirby is, is listed as the ensemble leader. It, they're also sometimes called the John Kirby Sextet. But I would also like to emphasize that this is a very collective effort in this group. Almost all of the ensemble members contributed arrangements to the group. And on top of that, 
almost every ensemble member contributes a lot of improvisation. So it's not the sort of group where only one person is really the featured soloist. As you heard just in this one recording, every single person got solo breaks and or a solo, right? Every single member of the band. So, um, you're going to want to... Yeah, can you question the band name? Yeah, so, multiple names, they're billed as the John Kirby Sextet, or the Onyx Club Boys, or John Kirby and his Onyx Club Boys. Not to be confused with the uh, previous iteration of the Onyx Club Boys, it was a band led, led by Stuff Smith, who was a violinist, mm -hmm. but the, the band that has the, the stronger legacy under that name is John Kirby. So, this band is also known by their nickname, which is, uh, quote, the biggest little band in the land. The biggest little band in the land which plays into our idea that it's a small band, right? But it, it almost calls to mind a big band with the, the orchestration, the complexity and intricacy of the orchestration, how, how logically and creatively the arrangement is put together. It sounds like it's much bigger than just six musicians, right? Um, so, you're going to want to write this down too. Here's the personnel. They're all very important and they all went on to make contributions in jazz. So, John Kirby was the bassist and arranger and the sort of de facto leader, he was billed as a leader, but as I said, it was more of a collective effort, especially in terms of <coughs> compositions and arrangements. Very important figure, Charlie Shavers. Charlie Shavers, S-H-A-V-E-R-S, -E trumpeter. I'll tell you a couple quick stories about Charlie Shavers. At the City College of New York, I had the pleasure of working with Ray Gowan, who's a great piano player who played in Dizzy Gillespie's big band for a number of years. At one point, he was sitting in the back, Ray Gowan was sitting in the back of the bus on a Dizzy tour with the big band, listening to some music, and Dizzy was walking back to go use the restroom. And he, he said, you know, hey Ray, what are you listening to? He's like, oh, I'm listening to John Kirby's band with Charlie Shavers. And Dizzy went, Charlie Shavers, give me that! And he took his headphones, sat down, and listened for two hours, and completely forgot he had to go to the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> so, according to Ray Gowan, Dizzy claimed that Charlie Shavers was his number one influence. So, playing into our, our idea that this is a pre-bebop ensemble, a bebop influencer, an influencer of the bebop style. Uh, so, Charlie Shavers, and you can hear it in his phrasing. He uses, uh, and everyone in the band, but particularly Charlie Shavers, he uses odd rhythmic phrases that are what we call over the bar line, hemiolas. He's very rhythmically active. He's using a little bit more chromaticism than earlier trumpet players. So that's Charlie Shavers, big influence on Dizzy. And again, so we can think of him as a transitional figure, perhaps maybe the uh, bridge from someone like Roy Eldridge, who's a more traditional swing player, to someone like Dizzy. On alto saxophone, Russell Procope. Russell, R-U-S-S-E-L-L. -L. Procope is P-R-O-C-O-P-E. You might hear some more Russell Procope later today, depending on which version of the Ellington Band, Dr. Bergeron, is going to uh, share with you guys. Russell Prokop is a fantastic alto player. His sound, his tone quality reminds me a little bit of Charlie Parker. His, uh, his phrasing also reminds me a little bit of Charlie Parker. And he ended up being the second alto in Duke Ellington Band later in his career. And the only reason that he doesn't get more of a spotlight is simply because of how powerful of a figure John Hodges was. But Russell Prokop, fantastic alto player. Buster Bailey on clay and clarinet. Buster Bailey, B-U-S-T-E-R. Bailey is B-A-I-L-E-Y. Uh, Buster Bailey was, you know, one one of those figures that can sort of fit again in a Dixieland context or a swing context. Billy Kyle was the pianist. Billy Kyle. He ended up joining Louis Armstrong's band in later years when uh, Louis Armstrong became a, f a famous international touring figure. And then O'Neill Spencer on drums. And then occasionally Maxine Sullivan is a vocalist, who is a, a very important Harlem singer. Who was the drummer's name again? Yeah, O'Neill Spencer, O apostrophe N-E-I-L-L, -L, and then Spencer is spelled as you expect it. So, they were called the Onyx Club Boys because they had a, a famous residency at the Onyx Club on 52nd Street in New York City from around 1937 to 1942. Uh, apparently, Duke Ellington cited 
John Kirby's band as his favorite band in the 1930s, according to Ray Gallen. And again, you can view them as sort of a lost bridge between swing and bebop. Sometimes the way the jazz history is presented, it's, it's sort of unclear how we get from, from swing to bebop musically. We understand the social circumstances, which I'm sure you'll get into, that has, that has to do with World War II, taking a lot of musicians into the service. Economically, it becomes more difficult to support a big band, so ensembles get smaller, and so on and so forth. But musically, this band, I think, is the, the perfect example of stylistically a band that's in transition from a swing style to a bebop style. Um, so, again, Charlie Shavers claimed Roy Eldridge was his big influence, and then Dizzy claimed that Charlie Shavers was his big influence. They uh, still maintain the big connection to the swing era with their showmanship, though, too. And I encourage you to, when, when you have time later today, go on YouTube or on the internet and search some videos of, of John Kirby's band. They do a lot of fun, jokey things. John Kirby does the classic thing where he spins his bass around while he's playing. Um, so some people view it as, as being, you know, not very tasteful, but they were very good with showmanship, and I'm sure that contributed to their long-standing success at the Onyx Club. Uh, so they also like to play really fast tempos, really fast tempos, which anticipated bebop. Um, they use a lot of syncopation, camiolas. They actively incorporated classical music into their, into their compositions. They did arrangements of the second movement of Beethoven's Seventh Symphony and a couple other things, so you should go check that out. Uh, and they were all virtuosos. Right? So, why is this band not more famous? It's sort of difficult to pinpoint these things, but a couple potential contributing factors is that they only managed to stay together for about five years. Compare that to Duke Ellington, whose, whose band stayed together for decades. Uh, largely because John Kirby had some health and personal crises in the early 1940s. Um, and then a lot of the uh, members were drafted into the war around 1942, into drafting into the military during World War II. And then on top of that, this entire period of American history is sort of overshadowed by World War II. And then as I mentioned before, all of the side men pretty much went on and had successful careers working with other important, important figures. And then on top of that, by the time you get to the mid-40s, bebop is starting to take off. So those are po potential or possible explanations why this group doesn't get as much recognition. So I just want to play uh, one more piece for you since we've uh, had a little bit of time to talk about it. And then I will open it up to some questions. So you already heard rehearsing for a nervous breakdown. Uh, I'm uh, not going to tell you this title and just see if you can figure it out.
Mm -hmm. Pretty killing, right? Yeah. yeah. Cool. So I'm gonna I'm gonna have to wrap it up there uh, for time issues. Does anybody have any questions or any anything else that I might be able to answer or point you to? Yes. What years were they active? You said they were there five years up. Yep, 1937 to 1942. Yeah, 1937 to 1942 was their residency at the Onyx Club on 52nd Street in New York. Yeah. Right. What was that song called? That was anybody know? Raise your hand. What was the name of that tune? Yes. Sweet Georgia Brown. Sweet Georgia Brown. That was their arrangement of Sweet Georgia Brown. So put that in your listening log. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great job.